the, the good thing that I did looking back was not quit and just continue to be, you know, optimistic that people will find me. And uh, if I'm doing the right thing, if I got a good product, I can't lose. Hey, babes, it's Kayla Craft with the Mommy Millionaire podcast. I'm a mom of three littles, ER nurse turned self-made millionaire and lifestyle entrepreneur. I am bringing you inspiring stories, business and mindset tips to help you be shameless in pursuing your ambitions. Hello, Mommy Millionaires, and welcome to this special episode. I have my friend Carl Scaramuza on who founded his company, Credit Blueprint, in 2011 with one very simple goal. He wants to help people use their credit to build real wealth and increase their net worth. And so you know I had to have him on the show to help all of you guys increase your net worth. So welcome, Carl, to the show. Uh, The honor is all mine, Kayla. I appreciate you having me on. Okay. So how in the heck did you get into the credit business? Uh, A failed drug test. Oh, really? What were you doing? Like, what were were you getting a new job or something? And (laughs) I was in the mortgage business from 98 to 2008. uh, And I had an opportunity to learn a little bit about the credit repair space in 08 because my uh, my income had dropped so much in 2008 with the downturn that I had an opportunity to jump into credit repair and learn it. And I did that for a couple months. And uh, then I realized that I hated the credit repair business because the mortgage business that I was in prior to that was simple. Like we were refinancing GM employees and you know it was just simple. It was just easy. It was like order taking and we were making very, very good money. So a couple months out of uh, the mortgage business and into the credit repair business, like I said, I decided I'm going to go running back to what I've known pretty much my whole adult life and try to get back into the mortgage business after I left. My manager at the time, she said, no problem. Even though you left the mortgage business, we got to do a simple drug test. Uh, and anyone that knows me, I've never, um, I've never done a drug in my life. Never. I got to be in control don't like drugs, don't do them, don't have any aspirations of doing them in the future, whether it's legal, illegal, I don't care. So it should have been pretty routine for me, Kayla, and it wasn't. I end up not being able to fill up the cup, uh, not to get into specific you know, details, but I couldn't fill the cup up. And the girl working the thing, she said, come back the next day. No big deal. There's no pressure, buddy. And uh, that's what I did. I came back the next day and on my ride in, human resources from the mortgage company that I worked at said, we suspect foul play because you you didn't do what you were supposed to do yesterday and we won't hire you back. So that's how I got into the credit repair business. I was forced to, I couldn't get back into the mortgage business and the company that I'd worked with for a very long time. Wow. Okay. So I guess when they say everything happens for a reason, it really does. Because in your case, what do you realize like looking back now that that may have been one of the best things that ever happened to you? 100%. Yeah. One of my coaches, Stu Middleman, uh, always says he has a chapter in his book that not everything happens for the best, right? Yeah. everything. Not everything happens for a reason. The reason could be good or bad. Everything happens for the best. So yeah, clearly happened for the best. And it forced my hand to learn that business. And you know, otherwise, I got to be honest with you, Kayla, I think I'd still be an order taker uh, up until this point in my life because that was like, that was my livelihood. We were making a lot of money in the mortgage business. And it's all I knew and it was easy money. And I think I'd still be in it. And I guess what? Here's, here's something funny. I still have friends to this day that never left the mortgage business. They have a text chain going. And every single time I do something on social media, they think it's the funniest thing in the world. Now, these guys are still in the mortgage business and they're laughing at me for going outside and trying something different. Wait, but. are you a part of the text chain? No, I oh. found that. Yeah, I found out about this through a friend who said, Hey, I hope you don't take offense to this. But he goes, But, you know, he goes, I'm a, I love what you're doing, but some guys think it's hilarious. They're laughing. Yeah. Yeah. But we like to make fun of you. And <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. I freaking love it. It, it kind of, that kind of stuff fires me up. What about you? No? no I, I would say before, I've had a chip on my shoulder my whole life, and there was this ego and wanting to prove people wrong. But I think it's a lot. It's really, really funny. I actually, I don't use it as motivation. I probably oh. should. 
but I, but I, I just think it's fine. I feel bad. I actually want to help those type of people that are stuck in that type of situation that, you know, they're, je- I mean, when you really laugh at someone and there's, there's jealousy there, you're missing something in oh, your life. Totally. Sure. It's just, it's just their insecurities. Mm-hmm their insecurities. But I, I kind of look at that stuff. Like I do, I feel bad for them too, but I also realize the only way that I'm going to inspire them to make a change is by making it so big that they Mm. can no longer make fun of you. You know what Mm. I mean? Like, like nobody makes fun of Oprah anymore. Like, you know what I mean? They don't. I just did a video or not maybe a couple months ago. It was uh, haters are going to hate at the end of it. I said, You know, your haters, they're just your biggest fans. They just don't know it yet. Why are they so consumed in my content and what I'm saying and what I'm putting out? They're they're really just my biggest fans. So thank you. (laughs) Thank you. Okay. So you're at basically, I mean, I don't know if this is your rock bottom moment in your life, but it's a it's a hard moment. How do you use the you know power of positive thinking or what did you do in your mindset to go i'm going to make this become the best thing that ever happened to me what are some tools that you had and you started to implement in your life you know i don't think i discovered the the power of positive thinking till a little bit later in my life i think at the time it was one of those things where i just i ha- i was forced to make it work my livelihood was on the line and i think the the best thing that i did looking back was you know, I didn't quit. A lot of people get really, really close to their goals or starting a business or six months into a new business or a new, whatever they're trying to do, and they're not seeing the results and they quit. So when I look back at that time, I actually lost everything. I lost a house. We lost a CLK 500 Mercedes. We lost my 401k. I lost all of my money because I was very optimistic thinking the first six months in business, I'm going to kill it. And everyone's going to want to do business with me and my business is going to be booming. And it was the exact opposite of that. Uh, didn't, didn't really make any money the first six, seven, eight months. And I had nothing saved at the time because I had lost so money with the downturn that I lost everything that I had at that point to actually start this business. So the, the, the good thing that I did looking back was not quit and just continue to be you know, optimistic that people will find me. And uh, if I'm doing the right thing, if I got a good product, I can't lose. I love that mindset. And I think a lot of people don't have that, right? They, they see the, the first sign of failure and they're out. Mm-hmm. What do you say to that? Consistency. I mean, I was just listening to your podcast. I've been called People say the most interesting man in the world. I've been the most consistent man in the world, at least in my mind. And other people have have really been uh, nice enough to give me that compliment. I'm super consistent with my routines and what I do day in and day out and going after my dreams and something bigger. You just got to be consistent. And so many people that are on the younger side, I would say, they struggle with consistency, Kayla. They're big thinkers, big dreams. They want to do X, Y, and Z every single day, day in and day out, be consistent. Don't quit to actually accomplish all those dreams. So true. All right. Let's talk about credit. All right. Mm -hmm. What, what if I don't have a credit card right now and what should I do? Should I go get one? You're in a lot of trouble. Look, life's hard without a credit card, right? I mean, you want to try, how do you travel without a credit card right now? Just for leisure purposes. Tell me how you get from point A to point B. You try to use a debit card and book a hotel room. Like good luck because they'll hold the money on the credit card uh, and then they won't release it until you're out of there for seven days later. So it's like you almost have to have double the amount of money. If you go on a vacation that costs three, four grand, you better have six grand in the account because the the hotel is going to hold that money if it's a debit card versus a credit card where they, they release that money right away. But you know, that's just that's on a good, That's a good point. I didn't even think of that. Okay. It's just, it's just hard. You know, and I mean, look, I, I've used my, uh, I'm going a little bit deeper here and I'll bring it back down on why you need a credit card. Uh, but I mean, I, I use my Amex Platinum card, which is, I, I don't know how people survive without it. Like it's just a great business credit card. I run all my expenses through there and then I get great perks with the card. I get upgraded when I travel for free rooms. I get to the front of the plane. I get $100 for spa. I get the Amex Centurion Lounge, all these really cool perks because I got great credit and I was able to get this amazing credit card. So as for a business owner, 
uh, whatever you got going on, you got to have that card. All right. So let's go back to the basics. Sorry, I got excited about my Amex Platinum card. <laughs> I got one too. I get excited as well. <laughs> so look, 30% of your credit score is based on what's called revolving utilization or amounts owed. So what that's saying is that's not installment loans like a vehicle. That's not a mortgage. It's not student loans. It is your credit cards. So 30% of your credit scores are based on credit cards. It's a huge piece of the puzzle, meaning you can have a vehicle loan, you can have some student loans, but if you don't have credit cards, you will never, ever, ever have great credit. You'll never be able to really use your credit. So it's super, super important to have many, many credit cards. Matter of fact, my ex-business partner uh, in the credit repair business, smart guy, Kayla, uh, a lot smarter than me. Look, I got 700 on my SATs in high school. This dude graduated number one at Harvard. And what he taught me when I was working with him is the more available credit lines and credit cards that you have, the higher your credit scores are going to go. And at the time, he proved it out. Uh, we used to sit around in these meetings uh, in the conference room, and he would bring his credit report in. And he had an 842 credit score. So to put things into perspective, FICO credit scores range from 300 to 850, okay? And he had an 842. So it's one of the highest credit scores I've ever seen. He had 200, listen to this, $250,000 in available credit cards, available line amounts on personal credit cards. So he proved out that the more credit cards, the more available line amounts you have, the higher your credit scores will go. Okay. So why do people need a high credit score? Well, I believe it's the foundation for uh, creating wealth. You know, any rich person that I've ever interviewed um, or had a conversation or dinner with or hung out with or watched them scale their business from nothing to 1.5 billion. I have friends like that. Credit credit was the foundation, you know, of whether you're going to lease lease a space or get some business credit cards or get a business line. Credit's just super, super important on your quest to, you know, conquering the world and having your dreams come true and creating wealth and going after something so much bigger than currently where you're at in your life right now. Because let's face it, on the on the flip side to that, Kayla, life is hard. Mm -hmm. When you don't have good credit, it just sucks, man. You got to get on the bus because you don't own a car. You know, you got to rent because you can't buy. And then if you rent, you got to deal with landlords and you can't even hang stuff in the house. It's just difficult. Can you exist without credit? Sure, of course. I know people that build million dollar businesses. However, that's as far as they got. Like in order to get to the next level, you want to be able to leverage this credit score, okay, to start to get really rich grow your net worth, create wealth, get something bigger out there. Does that make sense? Oh, 100%. So, so let's talk about all the things that I can do if I have good credit. Mm -hmm. how, can I, how can I grow my wealth if I have good credit? Besides just, I own my own home, blah, 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 all that stuff. Yep. That's, that's like uh, Dave Ramsey, middle America blueprint, right? Like, Because right. most people stop there. Uh, most people stop at, I have really good credit and I bought my first house. And that's as far as they go. And that's a blueprint for Middle America. So how do we go bigger? I'll give you yes. a, a perfect example of a conversation that someone recently called me. Uh, and if someone's ever following me on Instagram and they swipe up and click on a consultation and they mention my name, a lot of the times I like to get on the phone because I like to be like on the ground and hear what they have to say. I like people that actually acknowledge, hey, I'm a fan of Credit Carl and I want to fix my credit. I'll actually hop on that call from time to time. So I did that a couple of weeks ago. And it was, a, it was a lady who was following me, super, super nice. And she said, look, you know, I want to fix my credit because I want to take the equity out of my house. And what I want to do with that equity is I want to add, I want to put this addition on. It's like this $30,000 addition. And then we can just, this will be our forever home. So I said, no problem. So we stuck to the foundation of what my company does. I said, here's how we're going to fix your credit. Here's how much it costs. We got her signed up. At the end of the conversation, I said, would you mind if I videoed this conversation? And you and I started to have a little bit bigger conversation around credit and what you can really do with it. And she said, 100%. I'd like to hear it. I'm, you motivate me. You inspire me. I said, good. So I said, what if you took the equity in your home and you bought a second property? Like, what if you were able to buy an investment property? 
right? And we just started kind of building this out for her, which is, you know, instead of using that money that you might not ever get back, if you did a thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollar addition, you might not ever see a return on your investment. So why not use if we if we reverse engineer this, use your credit score to access other people's money, which is the bank's money, even though it's your equity, it's the bank's money, it's a mortgage, take equity out of your house and start to invest in other real estate. And um, she goes, you know, it's funny you say that. I've always wanted to do it, but I just didn't have the guts to do it. And I just needed someone to smile on it. And you're a hundred percent right. She goes, I'm hanging up the phone and I'm calling my realtor right now. And she goes, and I'm going to start looking at investment properties. And guess what? Now I'm going down this week to film her. She found an investment property that she put the money down on instead of doing the addition. And she's going to turn around and flip the property, make $150,000. So, Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Mm-hmm. I love that. So you're going to go film it just what to get some content for you or what? You know, I don't ever know what I'm going to do, right? Because I don't like to like manufacture stuff, Kayla. So what I'm going to do is we're going to go down there with the film crew and I'm going to video her gutting this house. And then we're going to see where it goes. Maybe that's videos boring and maybe it's a voiceover or something like that. But I I want to be able to show the power of what she's really doing with her credit scores and getting access to other other people's money and using it, Mm -hmm. making money. Mm -hmm. So smart. Okay. So what do what do I do if I have bad credit? Mm. Mm. You should wait. You should wait seven years and just hide in your house. You should be agoraphobic, hide in your house for seven years and never come out until your credit's better. (laughs) No, no, listen, listen. So, you know, I, I'm speaking from experience when I started. What's considered um, bad less than 700? No, I'm not really, because you can get like uh, you could get a hard money loan or you could get a mortgage with a 600 credit score. So I would say that's like middle of the road, like mid 600 credit scores is like the absolute bare minimum. Uh, and then once you do- drop below the 600 number, then that starts to get bad. There's not much you can do with, you know, three, four, 500 credit scores. So, you know, in order to rebound, the first thing you got to do is you got to ask yourself this question, which is, is the worst behind you? If you have, let's just say a 500 credit score and you can't rent, you can't get a car, you can't get a mortgage, you can't do any of this stuff that we're talking about. First thing you got to ask yourself is, is the worst behind you? Meaning when you, you got a 500 score, did you go through some kind of circumstance in your life? Like let's say you had a loss of income or you went through a divorce or something happened that got your credit off track. Is that circumstance behind you? The second question is, if it's not, is maybe it's something that's habitual. Maybe you have bad habits and you don't know how to pay your bills on time. I can't help that person with the bad habits, but I can help. My company can help the, 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 the client that is circumstantial, that went through some kind of situation years ago. And if it's behind them, we can start to clean up some of the negative things that are on the credit report, like collections, charge-offs bankruptcy, foreclosures. Uh, you, you, we, got re, we get repos removed. I got Look, I told you about how I started my company. They repossessed a Mercedes CLK 550. I love that frigging coupe. Uh, they repoed it and I got the thing removed, went back into that dealership a couple of years later and ended up getting another Mercedes from them. So you know, I'm not telling people not to pay their bills, but if your credit is bad and the worst is behind you, I'm going to talk about something. I'm going to stay right here. Okay called credit suicide. Here's what credit suicide is. Credit suicide is when you got really bad credit, like you're talking about, and you have some collections from, let's just say three, four, five years ago. Like you didn't pay credit cards, you didn't pay medical companies, and you have all these bills that are outstanding. Here's what credit suicide is. You decide that you're going to take it upon yourself and fix your own credit and not talk to an expert with the last name, first name, credit, last name, Carl, or whoever you're going to use, right? And you decide you're going to start to pay those collection accounts. Here's the thing. like If your audience takes this one thing with them, this will be huge if your credit's bad. If you actually pay a collection from three, four, five years ago, in essence, what you're doing is you're admitting guilt. You are putting a big fat stamp on that debt. You're validating and you're going to the credit bureaus. Yep, you're right. I didn't pay this company for five years and it actually lowers your score. That's the credit suicide right there. Oh, wow. So what, what does your company do then? 
Well, we try to get them removed. Our, our specialty is instead of calling third parties and going, sure, here, let's just say here's 50 cents or 40 cents on the dollar and let's pay you. Look, credit's a game, Kayla. And what I'm good at doing uh, is teaching people how to play the game. I, I didn't, it's not my game, right? I didn't create the game. I'm mm-hmm. not uh, uh, Naismith. I didn't create basketball, but I just know how to play this credit game. And in order to play the game, we send letters out. And what we do is we use what's called the Fair Credit Reporting Act. We challenge these collection accounts and we're able to get them removed as many as possible. So that does, think about this, instead of calling the company and paying it and having your scores go down, you as the consumer, we get to send letters out on your behalf, get it removed. You keep all of your money and your scores go up. So it's a win-win. But, but don't you feel like that's kind of bad because they do owe money to that company? Yeah, here we go. The first time you disagreed with me into this podcast, 25 minutes. I love it. So yeah, good. Look, you got to throw morals out the window. I mean, uh, would I ever give someone that advice if they called me and said, I have $30,000 in credit cards right now. I'm paying all my credit cards on time. What should I do? Uh, find a way to make more money. Man. You know, So it's not about you know defaulting, but if you went through something and the stuff fell behind, you will not get rewarded by paying old collections from the past. That's the bottom line. I had a customer that spent $5,500 of their tax refund money because they didn't listen to me. They paid all of the collection accounts from what was like four years ago and the scores dropped 50 points. So I mean, imagine spending five grand, losing 50 points. Yeah, yeah no, you're, you're out of money. You know, So look, it's the game. You got to learn how to play the game. And unfortunately, that's the way the game is, is played is you will not get rewarded for paying collect- collection companies from years ago. Okay. Okay. Well, so that's interesting. Luckily, I'm not in that spot, so I don't have to be faced with that dilemma. Not but easy. I would feel like that would be kind of hard for me because I always feel like part of like having a healthy money mindset is like if people you know, give you money, you know, and loan you money, then it's your duty to pay them back and like whatever it takes. Mm-hmm. But, but also you should have learned to pay it back, you know, years ago. Not right, remember I come in, I come in after that. I come in yeah. after the person that the worst is behind them and they let all that stuff go years ago. And I'm like, okay, look, you can do it your way and feel good about it and sleep at night and you're morally uh, great, but that, that will not get you any closer to having great credit scores. So. You know, that kind of sucks. I remember, um, Chase and I, when we first started getting credit cards, when it was like eight years ago, and we would max out our credit card every month, but we would pay it off. So we would hit the limit, pay it off completely. And it actually lowered our credit score. Yep. And I was like, what the heck? Like we're paying it off before the month is even over. How does that? Yep. And so now it's like, you have to, you have to keep it. You have to hit this certain level. You don't go above it and you don't want to pay it. I mean, why is it bad to pay it all off every single month? Mm-hmm. So go back to that uh, original example. Remember, I said my ex business partner. So when yes. you're in that, when you're in that type of pattern where you, you know, you're not in that anymore. But if you were, you had a pattern where you charged up a card like Kayla's talking about, and then you paid it down. You think you're doing a good thing. You're like, wait a second. I just showed the ability for the last 12 months that I can charge this thing off and pay it off in full. Why don't I have outstanding credit? And two, two pieces to that. One, the strategy that I talked about before with the more available credit you have, the better. So guess what? If you had $250,000 in available credit and you were using $25,000 every month to charge up and pay down, you'd still have outstanding credit scores. But if you only had $25,000 or $30,000 in available credits, what happens is, is you can't pay those credit cards off soon enough. So if you wait until you get the bill, and then the bill shows up and you pay the thing off in full, technically that bill goes to the credit bureaus and the credit bureaus report it every 30 days. And it looks like you have a balance. So they can't see that you're charging up and paying it down. They just see that every single month you have an outstanding balance on that. And that's what happens. So the key is one, if you are in a position right now where your credit is good, this is the best time to get money. So call your credit card companies up and ask for the simple line increases so you can have as much money available as possible. If you're not in that position, then what you got to do is you got to take a step or two backwards. And what you got to do is try to keep your credit cards under either 50%, 30%, or 10%. There's different tiers. Uh, And then keep it there for 30, 60, 90 days, and then go in and ask for the line increase. 
Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Rewind that. Write that down, guys. That was good. So I keep on thinking about like you, you kind of, I watch you on Instagram and you're very like sure of yourself. Okay. You've been in this. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Finish that. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, you've been in this for a while, mm-hmm. but I just know that there's a lot of people listening in. There's both men and women that listen into the podcast and they don't want to put themselves out there on social media. Like you do, like you're mm-hmm. the expert in credit cards, but nobody like came up to you one day and said, Hey, it's your time to become an expert. You just said, Hey, I'm at rock bottom. I have to become an expert. Mm -hmm. And so you did. Mm -hmm. What would you say to those people listening in right now? If they don't have an, a level of expertise that you do and whatever it is that they want to be an expert at, what would be their first like step to take in order to start like being an expert at something? Well, you know, we have a mutual friend and mentor, Hank Norman, right? So I always used to say, declare yourself the expert. And Hank would say, I, I don't love that. I don't think everyone should declare themselves the expert. Or they they have an expertise in a certain area. Um, but you know, for me, it was really about, I hid for a very long time, Kayla. I was kind of embarrassed about what I did. Credit wasn't cool. And I just kind of hid in my house and worked out of my house. And then one day I said, you know what? You know, because you're seeing this confident person now. I appreciate you. Uh, appreciate the confident, uh, the compliment, which I think it was. You're seeing this confident person now because I hid for so many years. And I said, no, "There's no, 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 no. I know too much. I've seen too many credit reports. I've seen the good, the bad, the ugly. I've helped all different types of scenarios, and I'm not going to hide anymore. I'm going to tell everybody what I think and what my opinion is, and how they can make their credit situation better." So, you know, if if I'm giving someone advice out there, obviously, if you're going to be an expert, make sure you're truly the expert at something. But then from there, just there should be, you should not care about what anyone thinks at all. When I'm in my purest form, it's just me and a mic and a camera. Now that is a muscle that I built up over time because I did care. When I first started doing videos, you know, let's just call it two and a half years ago. What all I cared about were the views and the comments and what people thought about me and the way I looked. Well, now, you know, it's this muscle that I built up over time, pressing the record button, button, talking about, you know, my craft and what I do, helping people with their credit along those lines. And then I just record it, record it, record it. And I don't care what people think. I, I, I don't. And the more that comes across and what I'm saying, the more authentic it is. And the more people that want to follow me, the more people I can have an impact on. Wow. I love it. So that was great advice for all of you guys listening in because I think, and I think it's easy to hear somebody like me or Carl say, I just don't really care what people think. And just, you just heard it from him. It wasn't always like that. It was a muscle he built up and it was the same way with me. Like I used to care, but then the more you practice not caring and the more you practice caring more about what you think of yourself, the more you'll be able to step into that level of expertise. And I just... Yeah. Can I add something there, Kayla? So, you know, when I first started doing it, I was curious about the feedback. Hey, am I doing a good job recording videos on social media? Do people like it? And it was almost like fueling my ego in the beginning. Like, yeah, this person likes it. Because what will happen is you'll have your friends. They'll, they'll be the people in the beginning that'll think you're doing great. But you don't want to do too great because those same friends want to keep you right where you were when you started. They don't want you to, to get too big, you know, for your britches. So, so from there, a lot of that stuff started becoming a little bit of ammunition for me in the beginning because they would go, well, I don't like the suit you wear. I don't like your flat brim. I don't like that you cursed. I don't like that you had a beard. And I would go, why, don't, why do so many people have so many opinions? Um, and once I was able to kind of fight, like I couldn't get to that spot until I actually put myself out there, started recording stuff. And then I was able to kind of handle some of those objections and go, I don't care. This is just me being me. I don't care if you think I'm 40 and I have a flat brim hat on and you don't think that's a good look for your audience, for your people that you're going to send over to me. Oh, well, too bad. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Okay. So let's, let's talk personal life real quick now. So you have kids and you're married. Yes. (laughs) Yep. How old are your kids? I got a, a 12 year old daughter. Tess and a 15 year old daughter, Isabella. Yeah, because I see you going on like little daddy daughter dates with them. 
Yes. Yes. How, how do you how do you find time to you know be a good dad and be a good business owner, be a good leader? How do you do all of it? Well, there's a couple answers to that. Number one, hire them. Okay. Hire your kids. So I'll definitely have my oldest. She worked for me last summer. She'll work for me this summer. Uh, I try to incorporate them as much as I do. If you watch my Instagram stories, which I have a lot of fun with, uh, I try to bring the, the bring them into the story to make them a part of what I'm doing. I try to get them the photo shoots. Like I do an OPM show on Sunday nights. You know, I have them come in and be part of the show, start the show, make them feel special and pretty and make sure that they're doing photo shoots with me and be a part of it. Um, But here's the other thing though, Kayla, too. Here's the power of social media. I'll let you in on it. I don't think I've ever shared this with anyone, but you know, I'm divorced and uh, I get my kids half the time, right? I get them Tuesday, Thursday, and every other weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So You know, in some cases, that's an advantage because I get to really focus in on the business when I'm not with them, obviously. But here's the other thing, though. When I'm on my story and I'm talking about my day, what I had to drink, how many people I helped out, uh, my morning routine, running, guess who's watching that when they're not with me? Your kids. My my kids, you know, and I can see them watching my story and they make comments and they send me little hearts. So it's like, They're there on my journey watching me on social media. How powerful is that? You know? Oh, that just gave me chills. That's amazing. Cause it Mm -hmm. whatever they decide to do, it's like they're they're not gonna be waiting for a permission slip. They're gonna be like, Daddy did it, I can do it. You gotta lead you gotta lead by example too. I have these the deep conversations with them. I just I don't wanna be that parent that's the know-it-all that didn't do anything. Like they know what's best for you as a parent, but they didn't accomplish anything in their life. And I just don't want to be that person. Now there's a flip side to that, Kayla. I also don't want to be the person that spoils their kids and their kids don't do anything and they have all the best things in life. So I'm in between both of those parents. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. You all want right, to talk so- about my wife? Yeah, let's talk about it. You know, How's let's that talk, going? That's my ride or die right there. I um, love it. I was speaking down in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee uh, at an event called NugaCon, and somebody was in the audience. And I kept saying, because I had my wife with me, and I kept saying, she's my ride or die. She's my ride or die. And it's funny. He didn't, he didn't take it as she was my... He, he had his own perception of what I was saying. He kept saying, I think you got to be a ride or die with your business. Like you're all in. And I'm like, no, 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 no. My wife... That's my ride or die. You need a, a partner on your side if you're going to go through this this journey of life. Um, it, I, I don't really know where I would be without her. I mean, she's she's the first person that pushed me to start this business. She said, "Carl, you don't need anyone. You can do it on your own." And there's just so many times that she pushed me to get to a different level. You know, you got to have the partner that fits for you too. She's one of the. She's a risk taker like me. So like when we talk about you know, taking big risks with our business. She's not the person on the other end going, Carl, let's just do uh, this and be conservative. She's gone. I trust you, babe. Now you and I had this conversation, Kayla, when you were on my podcast, which is, you know, that, that built up over time, right? Over time, she was like, the more victories I had with our money, the more she said, just do it, hon. I got your back. Mm-hmm. You know, that's pretty, pretty powerful. Yeah. It's like almost, they need to see a little proof in the pudding and you've done that. And so now she trusts you. And I think people like listening in, they might not have that with their partner yet. Mm -mm. What do you say to those people? Kick them out. You know, if I'm, if I'm keeping it real, you're with the wrong person. God, so much time with relationships. Somebody will come to me and ask me advice. And I'm like two seconds into the conversation, I'm thinking you're with the wrong person, you know? And It's the truth. I mean, it might be cringeworthy, but if someone is holding you back, if they are watching things, successes that you're having in your life and they're poking holes in it and you find them being jealous and not being on your side, you got the wrong partner, man. I mean, you really do have the wrong partner. You got to have that. I, I honestly would not be where I'm at if it wasn't for her being on my side. So I know it's easier when I'm on the other end of it. I w- those are my standards. I wouldn't accept anything less than somebody that was uh, in this to win it with me. Yeah. I think like, I mean, I hear what you're saying, but mm-hmm. then at the same time, like if I would have given up on my husband, you mm-hmm. know, years ago, then I would be divorced right now. And now yeah. he's in a much different spot where he's very supportive. He's mm-hmm. 
he's all about it, but it took probably six years. And so I think it's just like asking yourself that question, how long are you willing to wait and how much are you losing of yourself and of your future by waiting, you know? Yeah. Look, I'm not Dr. Phil. So you're yeah. right. Okay. I took it. I, t- <laughs> I took it like to the extreme Kayla, which is like constantly someone bringing you down and, you know, not rooting, yeah. you know, it's, it's hard. It's really, it's really difficult, but there is that happy meeting. Like you're talking about you and your husband for what you've been through. Pretty amazing. You know? Yeah. So, all right. Let's switch gears. I hate talking about marriage because I always feel like somebody's going to message me and be like, you said this and <laughs> now I'm getting a divorce. I'm like, oh my God. So please nobody take this like too serious. All right. Please, um, <laughs> so let's, let's bring it back to the credit real quick because I think that most people don't realize all the opportunities. So you, you mentioned one example of how you're helping this woman, you know, flip a property. Mm -hmm. What are some other things people can do right now today, if they have good credit to start investing in their wealth? Well, I always say my top three high producing assets are number one, real estate. Number two. So do you like, like multifamily units? Like, is that? No, I hate, I hate it. Uh, I don't invest in real estate right now. I'll, I'm gonna I'm gonna explain why. I believe Ooh. in real estate. Yeah, because there's this myth like most millionaires have seven different sources of income. But I think most millionaires went really deep on one thing and then they started to diversify. They didn't diversify from day one and have five businesses and sixteen pieces of real estate. I, yeah, I that agree. is true. That that's they, true. Right. They went, they got really good. They went deep on one thing, got good at that, made a couple million first. Anyway, so here's my thoughts on that. Top three high producing assets if you want to grow your net worth, get really rich. Number one is real estate. Number two, okay, is your business. All right. And if you don't know anything about number one or number two, the third thing you would invest in is yourself. And when I say that, like, let's say you don't know anything about real estate, you don't know anything about, um, you know, a business, get around successful people just like you, Kayla. I'm watching your, um, What did you just have? I was just on your mastermind. Mastermind, Like that is what I'm talking about. Get around successful people like Kayla. All right. That know how to do it. Make the investment in yourself to be with her. Okay. Whatever that might be a group, a Facebook group, a mastermind, and then apply that to your business. And here's why I like investing in yourself in those two assets, right? Your business or real estate. Here's why. Because it's you. Here's what I don't like about Bitcoin and the stock market. Like You're gambling on someone else. I want to bet on me. Right now, I'm betting on Carl. I'm betting on my business and I want people to do the same thing. And sometimes if you're going, I don't, I don't know how to do that. Get around successful people like you. Mm. I always say pay to play. play, pay to get into the rooms of people that know more than you do. And I, I just had Marshall Silver on the podcast. Mm. His episode came out just a couple of days ago. And I asked him, uh, you know, if I had an extra $100,000 right now, where should I invest it? And I thought he was going to say real estate because that's what a lot of what people he say. He said, had to have said your business. No, he said, he said, invest it in yourself. He said, get a Fair mentor, enough. get a mentor that knows more than you and give them the money. And I was like, okay. Well, we're, on, we're on the same page there. I love Yeah, that. I thought that was interesting because... Like for me, I, I kind of feel like there's this like double-edged sword because there's these people that I see them do, they're course hoppers and they're, they're coach hoppers and they're going to coach after coach after coach and they still are broke as a joke. And oh so I'm like, God, okay, people, yeah. yeah, you got to take action. Mm-hmm. And then there's this other thing where it's like me, I'm in, you know, I'm in three different masterminds right now. I have a business coach. I got a meditation coach. I got all these people helping me. <laughs> And sometimes it feels a little bit overwhelming, but I'm still taking massive action. And I know I'm going to be much further along than if I was trying to do it alone right now. But I think the, the thing is, is like invest and take action, invest, take action. It's a beautiful answer that he gave you. And I feel like that answer was specifically for you. And I 100% agree with that. And I, if you look at it, it's all over my Instagram. You know, I take all of my profits and I dump it right back in to myself. And part of myself is my business. But that answer was for you because you're just a very powerful, successful, 
influential person and they're the only person that could stop you is you. So the greater your mindset gets and the more you get around people that are thinking like once in a lifetime, holy shit ideas like Facebook, you're, you're a force to be reckoned with, Kayla. That's good. That's good. Carl, what's the most shameless thing you've done to build your business? <laughs> the most shameless thing I've done to build my business. God, what a kind, what kind of question is that, Kayla? Well, my tagline for the show <laughs> is "Be Shameless." Okay, mm-hmm. so I like to show people that, like, we've all done things that were like, "Oh my God, I can't believe I did that," but I'm glad I did it because it got me to where I needed to be. So, like, for instance, I used to walk around, you know, the malls, and anybody that was filling out an application to get a job, I would go up to them and say, "I'm hiring," and you could start it. You could start your own business with me today. And I would make them fill out an application to join my network marketing team. And I would just go up to random people and I had no shame. And I just, it built momentum and built my confidence up. And most people like wouldn't do that. But Mm -hmm. because I did that, I'm a millionaire today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say it's good. That's a good one. I mean, my, I mean, I probably should have been more shameless because, you know, I, I probably should have lied a little bit more about certain things that I was doing and I was waiting for people to give me credit to actually get to where I'm at today. And they never did. It never came. Um, I should have been more shameless going back. So I like that. But I would say the the most shameless thing I probably did was trying to hire people back in the day. I would just paint this picture like we were this gigantic company and we were doing giant numbers and it'd be this amazing opportunity to work with us. And I attracted people that way before until they actually showed up at the office and then the, the, the sale was me. Hey, you're with me. I'm, I'm the person. I'm the sale. So pro- probably that. Probably uh, attracting people on their false pretense. Oh, you're the hype man. Right? <laughs> oh, my yeah. gosh. Okay. So where can people find you at? I, I'm, I do all my dirty work like we talked about on Instagram. It's credit.carl. I probably spent too much time on Instagram. I probably, I don't know what the the stats are. So yeah, credit.carl. And then Facebook, we do my live show, Credit Blueprint Credit Coaching. That's my credit repair company. Uh, and I do do credit repair. I had a guy that comes saw me speak on stage and my name's cre- my nickname's Credit Carl. He goes, oh, I didn't know you fixed credit. I go, oh, okay. Yep, Credit Carl. My company does fix credit. We help repair credit. Okay. So anybody listening in right now, if they wanted to repair their credit, they could do that by hitting you up right now. Yeah. They can go right in there, DM me, say, Hey, I heard you on this podcast. Or how about this, Kayla? You got to check your credit ego at the door. If you're listening to this podcast right now, I'm going to challenge you to think bigger. Scores range from 300 to 850. So don't be that person like my brother. I won't name which one. I got two of them who wants to tell everyone how great his 720 credit score is two things with that. One, 720 can go higher. You can get an extra 100 points. There's a lot of room for improvement. And the second thing is what you do with your credit. Okay, credit, having great credit is not about telling your brother that you have better credit, not about telling your neighbors uh, or fancy cars or ego or flash or anything like that. Having great credit is a weapon. Okay, that's a phrase there, a weapon that you can use to leverage to get really rich. Okay. It's not about ego and flash. I love it. All right, you guys, if you loved this episode, make sure to tag me, Kayla.craft and credit Carl on Instagram. Let us know what you learned, share it out there on your social media. You guys, we do this show completely for free just to help all of you guys grow your wealth. And the least you could do is share it out there for us and DM us. If you have any questions, Carl, are you open for that? Yes. I live in the DMS. Please do. (laughs) All right. Um, and as always, ladies go out there and get what you want. Thank you for listening to the mommy millionaire podcast. For free resources and materials, head over to mommymillionaire.co. Make sure to follow Mommy Millionaire on Spotify and subscribe on iTunes. And it would mean the world to me if you left a five-star review of the show. And as always, ladies, go out there and get what you want.